It is such a great joy and such a great blessing to be in this virtual and yet still sacred space with you. Uh, you might notice that today we are not at Mosaic and that's because I realized a little bit too late that the audio from our previous recording was just too, it was too messy and there was no way to clean it up and it was just, we just couldn't save it. So here we are, we're still here and we're gonna still worship together and I'm looking forward to see what God is going to do with us and through us. Um, but before we begin, I do wanna ask you, what is it that you need today? Is it grace, love, strength, confidence, forgiveness? Whatever it is, I invite you to ask God to give it to you today. And keep this prayer in the forefront of your mind as we progress and go into worship together. Now please join me in our call to worship. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be His kingdom now and forever. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. pray. Almighty God, the fountain of all wisdom, you know our necessities before we ask and our ignorance in asking. Have compassion on our weakness and mercifully give us those things which for our unworthiness we dare not and for our blindness we cannot ask. Through the worthiness of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, 
who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from Genesis. Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. He reached a certain place and spent the night there. When the sun had set, he took one of the stones at that place and put it near his head. Then he lay down there. He dreamed and saw a raised staircase, its foundation on earth, and its top touching the sky, and God's messengers were ascending and descending on it. Suddenly the Lord was standing on it and saying, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will become like the dust of the earth. You will spread out to the west, east, north, and south. Every family of earth will be blessed because of you and your descendants. I am with you now. I will protect you everywhere you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done everything that I have promised you. When Jacob woke from his sleep, he thought to himself, The Lord is definitely in this place but I didn't know it. He was terrified and thought, the sacred place is awesome. It's none other than God's house and the entrance to heaven. After Jacob got up early in the morning, he took the stone that he had put near his head, set it up as a sacred pillar, and poured oil on top of it. He named that sacred place Bethel. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We Christians love to use the phrase, and then God showed up. And, and that phrase is to describe the moment that we encounter God, the moment that God showed up. I mean, uh, we can use it to describe worship services, right? Like, oh, the preacher was going on and on and on and on, and then God showed up, and then it became the best sermon ever. Or we can describe, you know, a mundane moment like, I was eating a taco, and then God showed up, and it became the best taco ever, or whatever. In fact, even in our reading today, Jacob wakes up and he goes, God was in this place, but I didn't know it. Which basically, it could mean Jacob saying, I fell asleep, and then God showed up. And I always wondered, I always wondered, is it more God showing up in that particular time, moment, space, and place? Or is it more we become aware of God's presence in that particular time, moment, space, and place, but that God's been there all along. I'm reminded of the, of the story of Moses encountering the burning bush. Now, if you're not familiar with the story, Moses was in the desert for 40 years, uh, tending after his uh, father-in-law's sheep. And one day, he sees a bush, and he sees this bush that's on fire. And he sees that the bush, even though it's on fire, it's not being burned up. So he gets really curious and he walks to the bush. And then when he walks to the bush, God speaks to Moses and says, Go to Egypt and tell Pharaoh to let my people go. Now there are rabbis that believe that uh, there are rabbis that believe that that the burning of the bush wasn't a miracle, but that it was a test. Now I don't know if this is a boy thing or if I actually need to seek help, but fire has always fascinated me. And when I was about 9 or 10, I got caught playing with fire at my dad's church. It was after church on a Sunday. My dad had a meeting and my mom was, uh, was leading choir. And I was just bored out of my mind and I was getting hungry. And I had a cookie. And I was about to eat said cookie when I heard a voice in my head saying, hey, you know what would make the cookie even more delicious? Probably roasting it, toasting it over an open fire. And I thought to myself, you know what? That does sound like a good idea. So I went to the scarcity room where all the matches were, grabbed a couple of matches, and went back to the church, uh, back property of the church, and, and found all bunch of, a bunch of twigs and sticks and, you know, gathered them and started a fire and I was waiting for the fire to get just a little bit bigger big enough for me to like kind of balance a cookie on two sticks over the fire and whatnot when I hear the voice what is going on thankfully it was not my mom because that would have been probably really bad to get beaten on church property 
uh, but it was a church member who ended up telling my parents what happened. And when I got home, it was made very clear of how in the wrong I was. And from that day on, I never played with fire ever again at a church. Uh, the whole point of the story is from the moment, <laughs> from the moment that I got caught and uh, from the moment I started the fire and the moment that I got caught was about probably 10 minutes. And in that 10 minutes, um, the twigs, even the small twigs and sticks that I was, that was, uh, that was on fire, there were still, you know, you can tell that they, they weren't all consumed. It wasn't burnt. It wasn't burnt up completely. Some of the twigs that were on fire didn't even look like it was on fire. So what I'm trying to say is, is when, when a tree or a bush catches on fire, it doesn't burn up like that. It takes time for it to, to be consumed. So Moses had to have been watching that fire for a long time to realize that something wasn't quite right with it, right? Moses had to have paid attention to that fire long enough to say, wait a minute, there's something strange going on here. That, that, that bush is on fire, but yet it's not being burned up. Lord knows, well, yeah, technically, but who knows how long that Moses was staring at that fire before he realized that he was staring at something that was more than a burning bush. So that's why the rabbi said it was, it was a test, that God wanted to see if Moses could pay attention to something, to be aware of something, even if it was in the minute of details, even if it was mundane, to see if Moses could pay attention long enough. And when Moses did, God spoke. So the trick is, is to pay attention to our surroundings. To be awake long enough to see God without falling asleep or without being distracted. And when we are able to pay attention, when we are able to be aware, then a whole new world begins to open up for us. And this is exactly what is happening to Jacob. Jacob is, is waking up, and he's not just waking up from sleep and slumber. His, his heart is waking up. His mind is waking up. His life is waking up. His soul is waking up. And when he wakes up, he says, Surely God was in this place, but I just didn't know it. Which also kind of sounds like Jacob is saying, Man, if I knew that God was going to be here, I would have never fallen asleep. How many moments have we had that was like that? Like if we knew that if, if we knew that God was going to be there, uh, I wouldn't have I would have paid attention or or behaved. And now perhaps Jacob is wondering if God was here and I was unaware of it. Where else could God have been and I simply did not know? And see Jacob at this point is not having the best time in his life. He is on the lamb. He is running for his life. I mean, it was because of his own doing. He, he tricked his father, who was nearly blind. He, he dressed up as his older twin brother to receive his older twin brother's inheritance. And when Esau, his older twin brother, when Esau found out, Esau was so incensed, he was so angry that he threatened to kill Jacob. And it wasn't one of those, I'm going to kill you. It was like, I'm going to kill you and I kill you and I mean it. And Jacob got wind of it and he got so scared that he, he skedaddled out of town running for his life. And it was in this moment where he encountered God. And it's easy to understand that Jacob was concerned with other things like he was probably stressed out. He was probably full of anxiety. Where am I going to go? How am I going to find the people that my mom told me to find? How long is it going to take me? And he's probably stressed out. He's probably anxious. He's probably so worried that that was easy to miss out on God's presence all around him. Man, I wonder if, if you can relate to Jacob. That your life is just, you're so full of anxiety. You're so full of stress and you're, there's so many things to worry about that it's easily, that it becomes easy to get distracted from focusing on God's presence around us. The beginning of knowing about God and the beginning of knowing God is simply paying attention to God 
being fully present in the moment, being fully present in the presence of God. See, the Hebrew, the Hebrew language doesn't have the word spiritual. If you were to ask Jesus or if you were to ask Paul, hey, how's your spiritual life going? Which is a very common question that we ask one another, right? Like especially in times like this when we're stressed out and there's so many things that, that take up our, our headspace. A lot of times Christians ask one another, hey man, how's your spiritual life going? And if you were to ask Paul or Jesus that, Paul and Jesus would have been like, how's what, my, what, what now? Because to designate something spiritual we unintentionally designate something as not spiritual. If this is, if there is a spiritual realm, there are things that are outside of the realm, whether intentional or unintentional, that are not spiritual. And, and I think this is one of the struggles that we're seeing in the church right now because we've spent so much time, we have spent so much energy emphasizing that God happens in the church. You meet God in the church. You get discipled in the church. You worship at the church. You go to church to find faith. You go to church to find hope. You go to church and, and everything is come to church, come to church, come to church. And now we're at a point where we can't physically go to church and people are struggling because we've almost indoctrinated some people into believing that God only happens at church. But that's not, in the, that's not the case for the Hebrew people because everything, everything was spiritual. That's so why Paul was able to say, you know, eating and drinking is an act of thanksgiving, which is an act of worship. So whether you eat or whether you drink, give God the glory. Which is why the psalmist wrote, the whole world is full of God because everything is spiritual. God is right there where you are right now. Now, everywhere you go, God is there. Where can we go, wrote the psalmist, to escape from God's presence? God is everywhere. In your room right now, it is drenched with God's presence. When you're driving and stuck in traffic, God is there. When you're at work, mindlessly typing away, God is there. When you're doing all those paperwork, God is there. When you're at a golf course, God is there. When, you walk, when you're working out, God is there. When you're walking your dog, God is there. The rocks are full of God's presence and spirits. The, the, bird and the birds and the animals are full of God's presence and God's spirit. The people that we encounter bear the image of God and God's spirit and presence is with them as well. Everywhere we go, God is there. God is here. The question isn't, did God show up? The question has always been, are we aware of God's presence. So many times we Christians, and I've prayed this prayer too, God, please be with us. God, be here right now. And we ask God to be with us, to be in this presence. And that's, that's, not, that's not the right ask because God is already there. It's a matter of, are we awake to know and see God's presence? So my dear friends, May your eyes be open. May your ears, may your hearts, may your souls, may your life be awakened to the presence of God that is all around us everywhere. Now will you please join me in the affirmation of our faith. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, Light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and His kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. 
With the Father and the Son, He is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the church and for the world. Grant, Almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Guide the people of this land and all the nations in ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them the joy of your salvation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We commend to your mercy all who have died, that your will for them may be fulfilled. And we pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us confess our sin against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on us. Forgive us all our sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen us in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep us in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. I hear you breathing in, another day begins. The stars are falling out, my dreams are fading now. I've been keeping my eyes wide open. I've been keeping my eyes wide open. Oh, your love is a symphony all around me. The dawn is fire bright against those city lights. The clouds are glowing now, the moon is blacking out. Well, I've been keeping my mind wide open. I've been keeping my mind wide open Oh, your love is a symphony All around me, running to me Oh, your love is a melody Underneath me, running to me Keep my hopes unbroken. Oh, your love is a symphony all around me, running through.
me Oh, your love is a melody Underneath me Run into me Your love is a song Through Christ, let us continually offer to God the sacrifice of praise, that is, the fruit of lips that acknowledge His name. But do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Now please join me in singing the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. My dear friends, let us enter this week awake to God's grace, and let us go forth and bless the Lord. Amen. With my eyes wide open, I've been keeping my hopes unbroken. Oh, your love is a symphony all around me running through me Oh, your love is a melody underneath me running to me Your love is a song